Hi, welcome to OpenJS. We're going to talk about JavaScript, the grumpy parts. JavaScript is kind of weird, but well, let's dig in and see how it works and see if we can understand why it's weird and make it a little bit less mysterious. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. And well, they're already there. <laughs> I've been the person chasing the, the st speaker as well. And yeah, here's JavaScript, the grumpy parts. The slides are online right now. While you're here on robrich.org, click on About Me, and you'll get to this spot that talks a little bit about the things that I do. I'm a Microsoft MVP, a friend of Redgate, a Cyril developer evangelist, and let me tell you about AZ GiveCamp. AZ GiveCamp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ GiveCamp. Or if you'd like a give camp where you're connecting from, hit me up on email or on Twitter, and let's get a give camp in your neighborhood too. Some of the other things that I've done, I worked on the Gulp team as a core contributor in version 2 and version 3, and .NET Rocks. I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode, they read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug! Woohoo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. Woohoo! So let's dig into JavaScript, the grumpy parts. Now, we will need to go a little fast because, well, we only have a half hour together, but I would like to thank John Mills. He has a talk, a, jo a guide to JavaScript scary side that helped inspire this talk. Now, he goes in different directions, but his talk is amazing. And so if you have a chance, listen to him as well. We'll probably hit the end of my knowledge, and that'll be really fun. I look forward to uh, the part where I say, I don't know. <laughs> In the beginning, Brendan Eich created JavaScript in 10 days, 25 years ago. I've written some code 25 years ago, and it was pretty awful. And yet, here we all are talking about JavaScript. Brendan did an amazing job. If you'd like to learn more about Brendan, read more or watch more to see how he invented JavaScript. It's really cool. Each of these blue links in the slides here from robrich.org are links to be able to dial into additional information. Now, what's really cool is we now have a bunch of JavaScript engines that are, for the most part, really high fidelity. In V8, we have Chrome. In SpiderMonkey, we have Firefox. In, uh, in Internet Explorer, we have Chakra. In Safari, we have JavaScript Core. And each of these JavaScript engines works pretty much the same. Brendan Eich's library was cloned with amazing fidelity. Now we talk about differences between JavaScript in different browsers. HTML5 has made that a little bit less of a concern. But that was about our interaction with the document object model, the DOM. The JavaScript runtime itself is amazingly compatible, including all the bugs. <laughs> so JavaScript was copied with incredible precision, including the bugs. Let's take a look at some of the weird things. Now, some of the major design goals of this language was it was a language that, well, runs over there. When we develop JavaScript, we ship our source code, a .js file. The browser is the one that compiles that JS code into executable and runs it. Now, that isn't quite right, but we can use that analogy. It runs over there after the developer has left. So one of its primary objectives is to keep running as often as possible. Now, if it keeps running, it's going to try to be as forgiving as possible. So, well, if it notices a syntax error, it'll back up and see if it can put a semicolon in to be able to solve that. Now, are semicolons required in JavaScript? Well, yes, they are. <laughs> but the engine may insert them automatically. So if you see JavaScript without semicolons, uh, that's why. We're leveraging that piece of the compiler that says, hey, let me fix that for you. So let's take a look at some of the weird things in JavaScript. This is the JavaScript WAT talk. And I'm not going to play it for you, but I invite you to grab these slides from robrich.org and click play. What's particularly cool is this is Brendan Eich playing the JavaScript WAT talk at one of his talks and his commentary throughout it. It is amazing. So let's take a look at some weird things. Undefined. Well, undefined is just a variable. So what if we 
define it. <laughs> in more recent versions of JavaScript, of ECMAScript, it is defined as a constant, so we can't override it. But this led to some really, really interesting bugs. If, so for example, we defined JavaScript. Type of null. Type of null is an object. Hmm. Should it be null? Should it be an object? This is probably one of those bugs. <laughs> Brendan Knight created it in 10 days. And uh, a few weeks after that, he said, you know, there's some bugs here I'd like to come back and fix. And he was told, hey, there's 40 developers already building with JavaScript right now. We need to not change it. That would be uh, backwards incompatible. 40 developers. Hmm. I bet there's 40 developers in this room that <laughs> wish we had gone back and fixed it. But he made the best decision that he could at the time. Here's another one, type of nan. Well, not a number is, well, a number? I get that not a number is kind of in the number group. It's more in the number group than say in the date group or the object group or the function group. But not a number being a number? Yeah, that's kind of weird. So these are some of the weird things in JavaScript. And let's see if we can dig in and understand how they came to be and why they are that way. Now, first up, let's take a look at the JavaScript compiler. Now, I grant that in modern JavaScript engines, we have mechanisms for code split, uh, co tree shaking and just-in-time compilation, and those are amazing. But at its core, JavaScript is a two-phase compiler. The first phase goes and looks for variable declarations, and it kind of sets aside that memory for those variables. The next phase is to run the code. Now, because JavaScript has this two-phase compiler, then we can use that knowledge to understand some code and really dig in deep. If you'd like to learn more about the two-phase compiler, I would invite you to click through to the slides at robrich.org and click to read more or watch more. So let's take a look at this code. What's it going to do? Let's think like the compiler and see if we can figure it out. Now, the first phase, we go look for variable declarations. Here's one, var foo equals bar. OK, so we're not setting it to bar yet. That would be the execution phase. But we are declaring this variable, var foo. Next phase, let's go execute the code. So we start out declaring this function. Then we'll call it. So we'll start off and we'll console log foo. Well, we already have this foo variable declared. We haven't set its value yet, so we get undefined. If true, now variables in JavaScript by default are function scoped, not curly brace scoped. So we know that this foo variable exists out here. Now we're going to set it to bar, and then we'll leave the curly braces. This variable continues on, and we console log bar. So we get undefined and bar. So in our minds, we've kind of tricked ourselves to believing that the variables get hoisted. It makes sense to believe that, well, we just kind of move this variable declaration up here and we set it to undefined. Now, that variable hoisting is a cool lie that we tell ourselves, but that's not actually how it works. How it works is this two-phase compiler. Yes, variable hoisting. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a convenient lie, and it helps us to think about this in kind of a more synchronous way without having to separate that two-phase compiler mechanism. Now, that's interesting, but, well, it is a lie. <laughs> it's a very convenient lie, and I like it, but uh, hoisting is a lie. So as we think like the compiler, we can see how that variable hoisting, it isn't actually moved. Rather, it's, well... It's a two-phase compiler. So we saw this code, and we saw how we could execute it in interesting ways. Let's take a look at defining and not defining variables in various scopes. Now, we had a mechanism before where we declared some foo variables. Let's declare this foo variable and this foo variable. Take a minute to pause the video and think through this. What will it do? Now let's think like the compiler and figure it out. First phase, we go look for variable declarations. We find this one, foo, so let's declare that one. We find this one, let's declare that one. Now, variables are declared with function scope, so we have two different foo variables in different scopes, an inner foo and an outer foo, if you will. Now, second phase, let's run the code. 
So let's take this outer foo and set it to bar. We'll declare this function. We'll call that function. And now we declare this inner foo and set it to baz. Now, if true, now the curly braces don't define scope in JavaScript. Variables are scoped to functions. So we go looking for this foo variable to set it to bam. Is there a foo variable in the scope? Yes, there is right here, foo. So we set it from baz to bam, and we'll console log bam. We leave the curly brace scope. Functions are functions define the scope. And so now we console log foo, and we get this bam again. We leave our function, and now we need to find this outer variable. Is there a variable defined in this scope? Yes, there is right here. So we'll output bam, bam, and bar. Is that what you got? Let's change this up a little bit. Instead of declaring the variable here, let's declare it here. Stop the video here. How does this work? Let's think like the compiler and figure it out. Our first phase is to define all of the variables. Define this one, define that one. And the second phase is to execute this. So we'll set our outer foo to bar. We'll call our function, set our inner foo to baz. Wait a minute. Where do we get this inner foo? Well, we go looking for variables in the current scope. Here's one. This variable is defined as a function-based variable, so we'll set it to baz. And then we'll set it to bam. We'll console log bam. We'll console log bam again. And as we leave the function, then we console log bar. Bam, bam, bar. Is that what you got? Let's do it again, but instead we won't declare these variables at all. Okay, first step, let's go look for uh, variables to declare. Here's a variable, let's declare that one. Second phase, let's go execute it. Okay, so let's set this variable to bar. Let's call our function. Now we go looking for a foo variable. Is there a foo variable in the current scope? There isn't. So we walk up scopes. JavaScript is trying to help us. Of course, the co code is running over there once the user, once the developer has left. So we go looking up scopes. Oh, here's a foo variable. Let's use this one. So where it was bar, it is now baz. Let's do that again. And where it was baz, it is now bam. So we'll console log bam and bam. As we leave our function, we now console log the foo in the outer scope. Do we have a foo in this outer scope? Yes, we have this one that we set to bam. So we get bam, bam, bam. Ooh, Flintstones. <laughs> let's do it again. But in this case, let's not declare it at all. Pause the video and figure out what happens here. Now let's think like the compiler and figure it out. First phase, let's go define all of our variables. There aren't any. Second phase, let's go execute. So foo equals bar. Is there a foo variable in the scope? There isn't. Let's climb up the scope. Well, in this case, uh, we'll climb all the way up to the global scope, and we will define a variable there. JavaScript is trying to help us succeed. And so we define a global variable foo and set its value to bar. Now let's call our function. Do we have a foo variable set in this scope? We don't. So let's climb up the scopes until we get to that global variable that we built for here, and we'll set that to baz. Let's go find that variable again, set it to bam, bam, bam. We leave here and we log bam again. Now that's interesting. JavaScript helped us by declaring a global variable. But well, what if that variable was called i? And what if you used it and I used it? Now we may overwrite each other. It is after all a global variable. JavaScript tried to help our code succeed, but it may have done us a disservice by just automatically creating a variable. Let's do this again. But now let's set foo to bam. Pause the video here, see what happens. Now let's think like the compiler and figure it out. First step, let's define this foo variable. Second step, let's execute. We'll set foo to bar. We'll call our function. Foo, is there a foo defined in this scope? There is not. Okay, here's a foo. So let's set it from bar to baz. Now we'll set it to bam. Is there a bam variable defined in here? There is not. How about in this scope? Nope. Let's keep climbing up the scopes until we find it. Well, we didn't find it. So how do we get its, its value? 
we don't have a variable to get its value out of, so we get a reference error, bam is not defined. Now we could set a new variable correctly, but we could not get a new variable. Yeah, that is kind of weird, but as we think like the compiler, it makes sense. We can't read from a variable that doesn't exist, but JavaScript is gonna try to help our code succeed, so it will go create variables and set them if they aren't defined. All else being equal, I'd rather it just threw an exception. Well, kind of. I'd rather it threw an exception while I was developing it, but out there in the wild, it, yeah, I'd rather my user be able to continue on as much as they could. So let's do it again. Now we've defined variables here with var, but let's switch it up to let. Now let is new in ES6 or ES2015, and let is defined as bound to curly braces instead of bound to function scope. Pause, pause the video here and see what happens. Now let's think like the compiler and figure it out. First, we need to go define all of our variables. Here's one and here's one. Next, let's execute. Let's set the outer food to bar. Then let's call our function. Now we're looking for a foo variable. Is there a foo variable defined in this scope? No, this let means that this variable is defined to an inner scope. So we go looking for another foo variable in an outer scope. Oh, there's one right here. So we'll change it from bar to baz. Then inside of our if block, let's create a new variable and we'll set that to bam. So let's console log bam inside here. Then let's console log this variable. Well, we don't have one defined in this scope, but we have one defined in the outer scope. So here we will output baz. Bam, baz, and then out here, we're looking for this variable and we'll output baz again. Bam, baz, baz. Great. Now let's not define the variable. Okay, let's think like the compiler and see if we can figure it out. First, we declare our, all our variables. There's just one right here. Second, we'll execute. We'll call our function. We'll go looking for a variable. There isn't one in this scope. There isn't one in the outer scope. So we define a new global variable called foo and set its value to baz. Inside this if block, we have this curly brace scope variable. So we output bam and then baz. And then out here, we go looking for a variable in the current scope. We don't find it. We climb up the tree until we get to that same global variable defined here. And we output baz. Wait a minute. Did this variable leak outside the function? Well, yeah, <laughs> because we didn't define it scoped to anything, it was created as a global variable. That's weird, but well, JavaScript helped us. And when it helped us, it created a mechanism where our code would continue to run, even if it's in a little bit of an unexpected way. Let's do it again, but let's define these two variables here. What happens in this case? Let's think like the compiler. Well, everything works well inside this function. Once we get out here, we're going to get to this foo variable and we're gonna go look for a global foo variable. Well, there's no variable defined in this scope. Let's keep looking for a global variable. Nothing was defined here because all these variables were defined. So we get a reference error. Foo is not defined. Foo is not defined because, well, because I defined these variables inside this containing function, then they expired once we left that scope. Let's do it again, but let's switch from let to const. Now const in ES6 is a variable that can't change. Now the contents of that object can change, but the variable itself cannot. <coughs> so let's dig in and take a look. Well, we define our variable, we call into our function, and now we're looking for a variable called foo in the current scope. This one is an inner scope, so we can't grab that one. So we go looking for this outer scope and we go try to set it. Ooh, we can't set a constant, so we get assignment to a constant variable. Now, if we're using Babel to transpile from ES6 to ES5, where const doesn't exist, then it changes this const to a let, or no, it changes a const to a var, and yes, we can <laughs> assign a var. So we'll get different behavior. Every evergreen browser supports ES6 or better now. So probably we want to turn down Babel to output ES6 or better and ensure that that const is indeed const. 
But that's why you might get different behavior inside of um, Babel. So we took a look at defining variables. Let's take a look at this. What is this? Well, it's the thing to the left of the dot. Let's take a look at some examples. And we have this speak function where we console log this dot name. Now we're defining name out here in a global way, well, global to this space. So if we call speak, what is the thing to the left of the dot? Well, global. <laughs> so we get ninja. Now let's call obj1.speak. We could definitely have created this speak function in the middle here, but um, I just copied it into place for each of the objects. So obj1.speak, what is the thing to the left of the dot? Well, it's obj1, so we get doctor. obj2.speak, we get skywalker. Perfect. Ninja, doctor, skywalker. Let's do it again, but let's uh, grab it out as a function. Now, in this case, it's no longer the thing to the left of the dot, or rather the thing to the left of the dot is global. So obj1.speak will work correctly, we'll get doctor. obj.speak, we'll get undefined. We didn't define a global name. Hmm. So let's create a new mechanism where we can go grab a button. Now we grab it by ID, and then we click the button to call the speak function. Now what's the thing to the left of the dot? Well, it's the button. So when I say this.id, knowing that I have a get element by ID, I'm going to output the button. Perfect. Now, what if we want to change the speak function to output the name in 100 milliseconds instead? OK, so let's do it. Now, when we call obj1.speak, set timeout is going to create a whole new stack. So what is this in this new stack? Well, it's the global function, so we're going to get ninja twice. Hmm. Let's see if we can fix that. We can alter what this means by calling dot .call. Now, we'll say dot .call, and we'll pass in what we want this to be. So taking a look at this code, obj1.speak obviously works as expected, but we don't have a speak function in obj2. So we'll say obj1.speak.call and set this to be obj2. Now this is set to be obj2. We've overridden it. And so we'll get doctor and Skywalker. Great. Well, let's do that same mechanism. We'll say dot .call this to try and fix our problem here with our set timeout. Now, it's going to say dot .call, but this executes it right away. So we will get the right answer, ninja and doctor, but we didn't wait the necessary 100 milliseconds. Let's look at bind. Now, bind is a great way to create a closure, a new function that has this set the way we expect. We can kind of think of it like this. This isn't the correct syntax, but we can think of it this way. Let's pass in a function and what we want this to be. We'll return a new function, and we'll say function.call with that set. Now we have this new function that we can call whenever we're ready, and that will actually do the function calling. So let's look at the real syntax, obj1.speak.bind obj2. OK, so because we're saying bind, we get this new obj2 speak function, and we can call it later, and this is already bound to obj2. So we get doctor and Skywalker. Perfect. <coughs> now, we'll probably see in our code obj2.speak.bind obj2 a lot. <laughs> what it's trying to do is saying, I want to set this. I don't want any ambiguity. That's perfect. If you find that in your code, that's exactly what it's doing. Now, let's come back to our set timeout function and let's call dot bind this. Now, dot bind this will return a new function that we can call later, say in 100 milliseconds. So now that we called dot bind, well, we've got uh, ninja and doctor. It works correctly. Very nice. Now, let's change to an arrow function. Now, what an arrow function does is it binds the variables at the point where the function is defined. We can think of it kind of like this. So let's define this function, bind it the way we expect, and let's see how this goes. So we've got this speak function, and we'll turn it into an arrow function. Now, because it binds at the point where it's created, then, well, 
this is bound to the global scope at the point where it's created. We get ninja, ninja, ninja. Oops. <laughs> that isn't what we expected. Okay, so let's say obj2.speak.bind obj2. We have this trick that allows us to bind this. Well, kind of. This is already bound into place. So wrapping it in another function that binds it to something else, then when it calls this inner function, it's already bound. So we can't rebind it. So yeah, <laughs> nope, that didn't work. Okay, so here in our function, let's use an arrow function here. We know that it binds at the point where it's created. So let's use that to grab the this. And now, yes, ninja doctor, it works as expected. Perfect. Now, what if we changed speak to be an arrow function? Well, then it wouldn't behave as expected. Now it would bind to the global this. But because we have this outer one as function and this inner one as an arrow function, it behaves as expected. Now that's a little weird. Knowing that arrow functions bind at the point where they're created will help us to understand a little bit about how it works. We shouldn't just change every function to be an arrow function. That would be, well, to bind this too much. <laughs> and we've seen that we can't override it. Now let's briefly take a look at the event loop. I love this website where we get to look at how the event loop works. Let's open this in a new tab and flip over to that tab. And we can take a look at this. This video is awesome. Now we have some code here and we have the call stack, what it's running right now, a callback queue and web APIs. For example, I'm waiting for a database or a REST call to complete. So let's copy this code and we'll go set it in place and take a look at how it works. Save and run. Now we start out with that set timeout. Okay, now it's counting for i equals one to three and it's counting and it's setting new content up here to finish. Once that finishes, it comes back down here into the callback queue. The, as the call stack empties, it goes and grabs the next thing from the callback queue and sets it in place. Now this highlights that great scenario where <laughs> what is it outputting? Well, it's outputting the current i. What is the i by the time it gets here? Well, it's um, three. <laughs> so we're gonna console log three, three times. But we get a sense for the call stack, the callback queue, web APIs. It is a perfect mechanism for being able to visualize those three pieces. I would invite you to play with that site because it is really, really fun. So we've got that stack where as the content is run, it's gonna run through all of the pieces in the stack. It's not gonna look at anything in the callback queue until the stack is empty. Once the stack is empty, it will grab the next piece from the callback queue and set it on the stack and process it. Read more or watch more about this and learn some more about it. Now, as we look at Node, we can think of it like this. Now, this isn't the physical layout, but this is a good logical layout. Each request has its own stack and callback queue and the things that it's waiting for. Now, as, as Node goes through, it looks at each request and gets it a little bit farther. Well, what if this request is gonna count from one to a billion? Well, then the, the callback queue can't get farther. So we'll, not, we'll want to do a lot of things to get to yield the thread as much as possible so that the other tasks have a, a chance to get caught up. And then we'll come back and, and compute a few more. So we might see something like this, set timeout zero. Well, why would I wait zero seconds? <laughs> well, because we're trying to yield the thread so that the rest of the requests can get caught up. We might also do this process.next tick. And in more modern versions of Node, we don't even need the empty function here. We can just say await process.next tick, and now we've yielded the thread for a second and let everybody else catch up. That is perfect. Now, if there's no other requests that need any attention, it will come back to us nearly immediately and continue on. Async and await. Now, we only have a minute, so let's cruise through this really fast. Async and await was clearly borrowed <laughs> from C Sharp. It builds a similar state machine as uh, uh, as the task parallel library in C Sharp, but it does it with promises and um, generators. So, well, what if we have this 
promise-based library here, and we want to upgrade some of the things to async and await. How do we do that? Well, the cool part is that async and await has this mechanism where we can just await things and start to feel as if it was synchronous. That's amazing. Now, because it feels synchronous, we can start to think about it with you know, standard fallback mechanisms. But we know it'll stop here until this is done, and then it'll stop here until this is done. And it's not blocking the thread, it's yielding the thread for other things. And then when it comes back, then it'll be able to continue on. We can think a lot more synchronously in spite of the fact that it's actually executing asynchronously. That's amazing. Now, do we have to wait until we do a big bang refactor to get everything? Nope. Async and await works as promises under the hood. So we have this async function, and let's call it, but not await it. What is res? Well, res is a promise that we can just dot then with. Now, we could choose to await it so that we would resolve the promise, but knowing that it is a promise under the hood, we could dot then. <laughs> So let's imagine that I have this legacy function that I need to call from this new async code that I'm writing. Do I have to use promises and a dot thenathon? No, I can just, well, await that function. I know how to await promises and it works just fine. Simultaneously, if we go the other way, then we can take a look at this async function and call it using promises. Now, in this case, we would like to do a lot of things in parallel. Now, we want to call lib1, call lib2. Notice how we're not awaiting them. So we have three promises. Well, how do we await a bunch of promises? Well, we have this promise.all, and we can await that, and then we have all our results. All these things happen simultaneously. Well, kind of. JavaScript is still th single-threaded, but I didn't have to wait for one to finish before I started two. That's perfect. JavaScript, it's an amazing experience for a 10-day project 25 years ago. I think Brendan Eich did an amazing job. <laughs> the code I wrote 25 years ago is not nearly as good as the code he wrote 25 years ago. Find me in that place that the conference has designated for Q&A. Or if you're watching this later, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich. You can grab the slides right now from robrich.org. Thanks for watching.